Thanks. Joining us now, calling in, Christopher Green, law professor from the University of Mississippi. Uh, good morning, Professor. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, this must be a, a kind of a fun time if you're a law professor than one such as yourself that I know is uh, very much entrenched uh, in uh, constitutional law, it's my understanding. And, and so what we got here is a situation where the Supreme Court of the great state of Mississippi has struck down a citizen-initiated ballot measure on the grounds of what really seems to be a conflict between the, the constitutional amendment that empowers people to put a measure on the ballot through the signature collection process that is required, and uh, I guess what happened. So how do we sort this out? First, did the Supreme Court get it right, in your opinion, sir? I guess I lean toward thinking that it probably was the right decision. They, uh, so in 1992, we put in a provision into the state constitution. So this is language that was picked by the legislature in 1992. And they said, you ha can't have more than one fifth of the signatures from any congressional district. And you always have a choice when you pick language. Are you going to pick out particular things or are you going to use a description that is going to change with the facts? And here they did not say uh, the reciprocal of the number of congressional districts, uh, which obviously one fifth was in 1992. Mm -hmm. the, the gist of the thing clearly was that you have to have equal numbers of signatures from all the congressional districts, but that's not what the language said. And in 2000, when we only have four, there was a self-destruct mechanism in the provision that got triggered. And hmm. given, given that the, the, the text, what the meaning expressed at the time it was adopted, given that that's what the Constitution is, uh, I think the court was right that they don't have the power to fix this screw-up. It's obviously a screw-up, but they just don't have the power to fix it. Yeah. So, I, well, let me ask you this then. Should the Secretary of State had certified this initiative uh, knowing that there might be a situation where it was impossible to meet that requirement, the signature harvesting requirement? Is, well, is that incumbent upon the Secretary? Is that incumbent upon the Secretary, I guess, to make sure that's in order? Well, this is, again, the Secretary of State doesn't have the power to change the Constitution either. So in 2000, right. everybody knew right away, oh, wow, yeah, the initiative process uh, presupposes we've got five congressional districts we don't anymore. Uh, right. And very early on, so this is, this is a, something that the Attorney General and the Secretary of State noticed in like 2003. Uh, and in 2009, we had a, an opinion from the AG uh, when, so we had, of course, all those initiatives passed in, or on the ballot, a couple of them passed in 2011. They had an opinion back then saying, well, I guess the best we could do is to just keep using the 1995 congressional districts. And um, so the legislature at that point could have proposed a different, uh, different amendment. Uh, we could have, you know, we could have had tried to have an initiative to change it. Of course, that would have been uh, bootstrapping and problematic. But there's really not a whole lot that the administrators can do. It's the legislature that is, uh, you know, they're the ones that drafted the language back in 92 that had this glitch. Um, mm -hmm. And they're the ones that didn't uh, correct it later on. So yeah. uh, I, I think it really is incumbent on them to propose an amendment uh, that would uh, not have this problem. Uh, and of course, they have, they can just they can abide by all the initiatives that gotten passed. It's up to the legislature uh, to, to do it. So they can say, well, just as a matter of a statute, we're going to ratify what the people did in November or what they thought they had the power to do in November. Uh, so if you, if you're upset with the thing disappearing, your chief, you, you, you should chiefly be upset with the legislature rather than the uh, than the Supreme Court. Yeah, and, and uh, that's consistent with what Mike Hurst, a former U.S. attorney, and Aaron Rice from the Mississippi Justice Institute had both of those gentlemen on the show the last couple of days, and they said the same. 
Uh, also had JT call in, and he felt the same. So I think we're all al- aligned in that. And I don't know if it's a matter of, I guess, placing blame. It's just that the the court's not responsible, uh, is the way I see it, for ruling or opining based on the so-called will of the people. That's that's not what they're charged with doing. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, yeah. So the the, the Supreme Court just it we. In all kinds of areas, we have relied on the courts to fix our screw-ups. And the more that the courts say, oh, you know, we can step in and fix this this screw-up, the more the other folks say, oh, what the heck, you know, just let uh, let the courts do it. And the more we get to let the courts do it mentality, uh, the sloppier that legislatures uh, tend to be. And here, I mean, it's it's hard to tell, really, whether this was sloppiness or deliberately, uh, deliberately designed poison pill. Uh, in 92. Yeah. I don't think it was, you know, I think there may have been some people who thought like, hey, why are we saying one fifth instead of equally uh, equal numbers from all the congressional districts? I don't yeah. know whether the conversations happened like that 30 years ago, but if they did, it's possible some of the people in the legislature said, yeah, that's not a problem. Uh, we can always propose constitutional amendments on our own authority. Uh, you know, it's not a big deal. The whole idea of an initiative process <laughs> is a breaking of the monopoly of the legislature on the power to propose amendments. So it's yeah. not a huge surprise. Uh, self-aggrandizement is uh, the way humans behave. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's not surprising that the people act in a way that maximizes their own power going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about curing this issue. So the Speaker of the House, Philip Gunn, has said he's calling on the governor to convene a special session to get together and fix this problem. But as I understand it, Professor, what would have to occur is if the legislature uh, did take this up, they would refer a measure uh, to the ballot for the people to vote on, which is our mechanism for amending the Constitution. And that could not occur till 2022, the next statewide election. That's my understanding. Is that true? I think that is right. Of course, the first thing they could do is just pass a statute saying all these initiatives that have gotten passed we will abide by them. So they okay, can well, cure that issue right away with just a okay. statute. And right, if the well, so does that doesn't not, do that, I, I, you know, I didn't mean to interrupt you, do but that, I want to smell a rat. Okay, well, here's what I'm trying to understand. Is there a conflict there? If you have the Constitution, which says you got to have uh, no more than one fifth of the votes from a congressional district, and then they go past statute, which which comes back and just changes that to some a language that doesn't figure that in, I guess doesn't figure that math in, or just says pro rata or whatever the current number of congressional districts are. Does that not present a conflict between statute and the Constitution? Right. So that wouldn't fix the initiative process itself. That would just okay. be a way to deal with medical marijuana and voter ID and the eminent domain uh, okay. uh, issue. These, these, these initiatives that have been passed based on uh, what we now yeah. know uh, securely is, a, is an erroneous interpretation of uh, the words congressional district in section 273. So right, we okay. still do need if we if we want to have future initiatives, we're going to have to have a constitutional amendment. No question about that. But in order to uh, respect what people did in November uh, of last year and you know November of 2011, uh, we don't need a constitutional amendment. Those particular issues, I think people who who think uh, think that the initiatives were a good ideas, and of course they they passed. Uh, they should demand that the legislature pass that kind of uh, statute. Just you know, just it, it would be a you wouldn't have to be very long at all. Just saying we will abide by it. Technically, if they suddenly next year decide we want to repeal those statutes and not abide by them, they would have the constitutional authority to do it until gotcha. we uh, uh, bake this into the initiative process. But in terms of you know, are you do you, uh, you do you think there's the, the legislature's up to something if they don't do something to ratify these initiatives that uh, we, th- we thought we got passed? I, I really do think you should you should smell a rat. Okay, so it's my understanding voter ID, which is one of those measures that did pass via citizen initiated ballot initiative, has been codified. So is there further action required there? To the extent that it's been codified, uh, it, it would. To, to the extent that the legislature has just by its own authority. Uh, uh, done that. There is some question about if they pass a statute predicated on the idea that it's constitutionally compelled and then they find out that it's not constitutionally compelled, 
uh, would we want to uh, re-ratify that with a, with a new statute saying, even though, knowing what we know now uh, about yeah. the, uh, the initiative process, about what one-fifth means and all that, uh, we still want to ratify these, these things. Uh, it, you know, it just it would, it would make 